Well, how's everybody doing this weekend? You guys doing all right? We are so glad that you guys are joining us. For those of you who are hanging out in Mount Sterling, in Lima, in Pittsfield, in Hannibal, in Kirksville, in Macomb, those of you here at 48th Street, those of you at 929, would you collectively give a gigantic hand for our newest campus in the great God-given state of Iowa, Keokuk. We woo! Those of you who are joining us from the crossing in Keokuk, we are so glad to have you. you. Just so you know, long before you started attending that church, there have been people all across this region praying for you, looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in you, through you, and around you. And we're so glad to welcome you to the crossing family. I'd also like at all of our locations to welcome all of our first-time guests. We're glad that you're hanging out with us. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called His Story. We're in week two, and if you want to hop online at thecrossing.net and pick up uh, last week's sermon, we know that you'll appreciate that. Uh, Jerry Harris, our senior pastor, is actually visiting a couple of our other campuses this weekend, so I have the privilege and opportunity of preaching to you, and I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We don't know exactly where you're at, but we'd love it if one of these days you'd uh, pop in and see us at one of our locations. We guarantee you'll absolutely love it. Well, I get the privilege this weekend of talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, and we, uh, we have at our house like one of these small little nativity scenes, and it wouldn't have worked for this, so I, uh, fortunately somebody had one, and I, what I'd like to do for this weekend serving is I'd like to kind of just put all the characters in the nativity. And I'd like to just talk about some of the nuances that each and every single one of them bring to the table because you read it and sometimes you miss the high drama. You miss the inconvenience of it all because each and every single one of these stories are something kind of just special about each person that, that God puts into the picture. So slowly but surely over the course of this message, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these different people in the nativity scene that I have uh, right over here. The first thing we got to do is we got we to gotta get to the town. You see, they've come to Mary and Joseph and they've said, hey, you, you can't have the baby in Nazareth because there's a census. And so we've got to go on a set almost 70, 80 mile trek to Bethlehem. Now, you just read that and you miss the high drama. We assume that there was a donkey because what woman who's nine months pregnant would go for a 70, 80 mile walk? Now hear this, guys, be careful, but guys, do you remember when your wife was pregnant? Do you remember her being nine months pregnant? When would you bring up the uh, 70 mile hike? How would you bring that up? I mean, I said that there's a donkey, so let's just assume there's a mode of transportation. Would you be able to look to your wife, hey, babe, you ready to go on that 70-mile uh, horseback ride we've been talking about? Oh, she would just be elated, wouldn't she? Now, we're not talking like this is a one-day excursion. This is two, maybe even three days of long travel, sleeping outdoors, getting back on the donkey if we got one. And imagine they're on the road. Now, I'm assuming this couple's maybe like me and Jennifer's relationship and that there's some bantering at times. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to Mary or Joseph, but I can, I can see him going on the road and Mary saying, I, I do not want to be doing this right now. And Joseph saying, hey, the president said we have to. And Mary going, well, you voted for him, <laughs> right? You tracking? You feeling the drama? So then they finally, they finally get to Bethlehem, and we get to pick the venue. Where is this baby going to be born? Well, they show up, and there's no room in the inn. Oh, if Mary wasn't already a little stressed out about the, the long journey, Joseph, you didn't even make reservations. So now I'm going to have this baby where? A barn? That's, that's where we're going to? That's where we're going to have our baby. We're going to have our baby in a barn. Ladies, hear me. No midwife, no doctor, no pillow, no epidural, no button that says come and do whatever I tell you to. 
None of that. No bed that just completely adjusts to make you the most, not, uh-uh. Here's Mary in a barn with her hubby. And he's delivering this baby with his carpenter hands. I mean, this is not, this is not normal. This is, you gloss over this, you miss the high drama that's happening in this story. Because if you, you put any couple in this kind of predicament, in these kind of situations, it's going to get tense. I imagine Jesus as a teenager coming in from playing games with, with some of his other friends, and he walks in the house, he forgets to close the door. Mary says, Jesus, what, we, close the door, were you born in a bar? Well, actually, Mom. <laughs> actually. And then she, well, if your father had made reservations, right, it just kind of starts to, sp- so we have, we have, this is our setting. Jesus would have been slumming it if he just showed up at the priciest of palaces. See, he left the glory of heaven. Anything that we had here on earth wouldn't have compared to what he was used to. But he didn't come to the priciest of palaces. He shows up in a barn. And what do we, what do we put, baby? Jesus in, we put him in a manger. When my boys were being born, Jennifer and I went, well, Jennifer went through this and I just paid for it. (laughs) The crib selection, and you search the different sites, but listen, Jesus, we're not talking, we're not talking Target, we're not talking Walmart, we're not talking Babies R Us, we're not talking shoot me in the face Ikea as I try to assemble this thing. We're getting none of that. We're talking farm and home. We're talking farm king. We're talking feed trough. I can just imagine walking into my house with a feed trough. Yeah, babe, I think, I think we'll put our kids in this. I can just see my wife looking at me, praying to God that she gets to go to heaven after she kills me. Right? But this is, this is where we put Jesus. This is how he shows up. Shows up in a barn. Gets placed in a feeding trough. Now, now, how does he get there? Well, he shows up because of Mary. Holy Spirit shows up, or an angel shows up and talks to Mary, and this is what he says that you will be with child, and you will be uh, come over by the Holy Spirit. And here's Mary. She's a, she's a virgin. So her purity is going to be questioned. She's engaged. So her marriage is going to be jeopardized. There is no way you can explain this to anybody. Put yourself in the, her family's shoes. Really, sweetie? Yeah. So you're, you're pregnant, yeah. And how? Well, God, would any of you guys buy this? How would you handle your daughter saying, yeah, this baby's God's baby? Put yourself in, in Mary's shoes. How distance would you feel from the people closest to you? Imagine the heartache of having to sit down and have a conversation with, with Joseph, your betrothed. But notice What Mary says in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. What can God do with a person like that? Recognizes that there's going to be opposition. Recognizing that it's going to be tough. But resolved to do what God called him to. What would happen in your life if you were able to make that exact same statement that Mary makes? I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Imagine you going back into your workplace, you going back into your family, you going back into your marriage. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Mary makes this statement of faith and commitment And it's because of that statement that she brings Jesus into the world. 
Well, it's not just Mary, we also have Joseph. Joseph shows up on the scene and there's the girl that he loves. And she sits down with him and she says, hey Joseph, I'm pregnant. Can you imagine how his heart must have sank? How frustrated he must have felt. So the woman he loved somehow ended up pregnant and her excuse is that it's God's baby. We know that he's not taking it well because an angel has to show up in the dream to get him back on track. Matthew chapter one verses 19 through 20 record these words. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph leaves that dream resolved to carry out God's plan. Think about Mary and Joseph sitting around at Thanksgiving with, with his family and her family and his family's going, so you're still gonna marry her? Yeah, even though she's crazy. Yeah, but it's not just her that's crazy. I'm crazy too. We're gonna bring this baby into the world. You see, Jesus shows up into our world through two people who are willing to be a little bit different, who are willing to embrace some criticism, who are willing to come across a little bit weird. That is how Jesus came into our world. And do you know how Jesus came into your world? A group of people who are willing to face some challenges and some obstacles, willing to be a little bit different, willing to come across a little bit weird. That's how Jesus came into your world. And do you know how Jesus is gonna come into the world of the people that you love and you care about? It's when you get resolved to say, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm gonna do what you've called me to do. I'm gonna embrace some criticism. I'm gonna embrace some challenges and I'm gonna come across to some people a little bit weird. But see, Jesus never called us to look like everybody else, to be like everybody else, to act like everybody else. He actually called us to be different. And if you are doing all the things that everybody else is doing, you are not the example that you think you really are. It's going to get warm, hopefully, God, please, it's going to get warm. And it's going to be nice on a Sunday morning, and you are going to want to go play golf with all your buddies. You're going to want an excuse not to go to church. You're going to want to swing the club out on the links and have a blast. That's great. Golfing is awesome. But if all your other people, all your other friends are skipping church to go golfing, what witness are you when you skip church and you go golfing? Like, hey, why aren't you coming to the, why aren't you coming to the tournament? Why aren't, you coming, why aren't you coming and playing with us? Well, I'm different now. I've got different priorities. Well, man, that's kind of weird that you're going to church. Well, I might be a little weird. He, he called me to that. You see, he said, you're the light of the world. The world is dark, but I'm supposed to be the light. Maybe you and your couple of your friends, you've gone on nice vacations every year. But this year, they're getting ready to go on vacation. Like, you coming? Ah, I can't. You're not going on vacation with us? No. Nope. Well, why not? Well, we started to obey God in the area of tithing. So one of the things we had to give up was going on super sweet vacations with you guys so we could be obedient to God. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it is weird. But see, God called us to be different. God called us to be a little bit weird, and maybe if we embraced what God called us to, we'd have the impact that we desperately want to make. Because that's how Jesus is going to come into the world of the people around you. Not with you looking like them and acting like them and doing everything just like them. You're going to have to be different. You're going to have to be a little weird. Now, the next person that shows up on the scene is the angels. Now, I got to be careful putting this thing up so I don't break it, so give me just a second. Since this isn't mine. Okay, angels, stay flying. Please, please don't lose your wings. Okay. Angels show up on the scene, and listen to what the angels said. But the angels said to them, 
Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The word good news there is gospel. When you read the gospels, that's the story of Jesus Christ. It's basically saying the good news is Jesus Christ. And here there's two things that make it good news. One, there's a Savior, which means we need it saved. That's the first part of the good news. But the best part of the good news is that it's for all people. It's for everybody. There's not a person you could talk to that Jesus didn't come for. There's not a person you can't bump into that Jesus didn't come for. He came for all people. You see, Jesus didn't just come for nice people. He came for all people. He didn't just come for well-dressed people. He came for all people. He didn't just come for educated people. He came for all people. He didn't just come for church people. He came for all people. He didn't just come for employed people. He came for all people. Jesus came for all people. That is what makes it good news. He came for single people, yeah, but not just single people. He came for all people. He didn't just come for families. He loves families. He cares about families, but if you don't have a family, it's all you, all by yourself. Good news. He came for you too. You see, Jesus shows up on the scene and the angels are saying, hey, he's coming, and it's for everybody. Absolutely Every single person, there's not a person that you're going to interact with at work that Jesus didn't show up for. There's not a person that you're not going to see on the street that Jesus didn't come for. He came for absolutely everybody. And what that means is, he came for you. There's nothing that disqualifies you, nothing that separates you from why he came. In fact, you're the reason. And what makes this good news is that Jesus shows up on the scene and he's showing up for everybody. And to highlight this, they use the shepherds. Now the shepherds were a smelly group of people. They lived out for months by themselves or maybe with a couple other shepherds just hanging out with dirty sheep. They were dirty, smelly, dirty shepherds. In fact, Shepherds had such a low reputation that they weren't even allowed to be a witness in court. The religious elite snubbed their nose at them. Shepherds had no value. And guess who get to be the first earthly proclaimers of Jesus' birth? Shepherds. Now put yourself back in Mary and Joseph's shoes because the shepherds end up showing up where she just had the baby. Now, for those of you who are pig farmers at all of our locations, I do not mean this to be demeaning, but you know how after work, how people who farm pigs smell? And can you imagine having a bunch of them? I'm not saying you're dirty people, but when you get done working, you know, if you're a pig farmer, you, you reek, you know this. I'm not saying anything you don't know. Your wife doesn't even let you all the way into the house. You have a shower out in the garage. Okay, imagine being Joseph, and you're in the hospital. Pick whichever hospital you want. And all your pig farmers come straight from the pig farm to see your baby. Can you imagine opening the door? Hey, babe, is it cool if all my stinky friends show up, come, come in for a little bit? Just say, hold the baby and hold the baby. But all these shepherds show up on the scene and they show up and then they leave. But this is what it says. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. God took a group of unlikely people, guys who their their words weren't even good enough to hold testimony in court, and he said, you're gonna be the ones that are gonna proclaim. You may have written yourself a permission slip saying, I can't tell people about the good news, and yet the birth of Jesus says the exact opposite. You might be uniquely qualified. You may have some stuff in your past. You may have some stuff going on in your life. But you could still be used to tell other people about Jesus Christ. No permission slips here. No get out of jail free cards. He's calling. If the good news is for everybody, he's also saying, and everybody can tell the story. Which means you can tell the story. Now, it wasn't just the shepherds that show up on the scene. We have the wise men. Now, the wise men weren't there on the very first night. We know that they showed up probably between uh, Jesus' birth and when he was two years 
of age. So eventually they show up on the scene. And there's something interesting about the shepherds, I mean about the wise men. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw this child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. Parents, if you're wanting to uh, tighten up the budget this year for Christmas, uh, there was a family that was staying with my parents when I was a kid, and we couldn't have Christmas while they were there because their family rule was, since Jesus only got three presents at Christmas, that that's how many presents their kids got. So I'm just, if you're wanting to save a little money, you could have a Jesus Christmas this year at house and only buy three presents for your kids. Save you a little money. And your kids are like, but I've been good. Well, Jesus was perfect. <laughs> so maybe, okay. Interesting, these people show up on the scene, they encounter baby Jesus. And they do two things. One, they bring him gifts. But the one thing that I've never nailed down before, this is first time, hot off the press for me, never even noticed this until I was studying it this week. They worshiped him. The shepherds show up and they worship him. Were the shepherds worshiping baby Jesus because he had fed the 5,000? Nope. Were they worshiping Jesus because he had walked on water? Uh-uh. Were they worshiping Jesus because he died on the cross for their sins? Nope. Were they worshiping Jesus because three days later he rose from the grave? No. The shepherds weren't worshiping Jesus because of what he had done. They were worshiping because of who he is. He's God. And God deserves worship. I know that worship is more than just singing songs, but singing songs is a part of worship. And I know what it's like to show up for church at all of our different locations. I know what it's like. You show up and you know the first couple songs, you're, you're, you're around for it. Maybe you get a little bit more into it in the invitation set. And sometimes you show up and worship's easy, worship's fun because your rent got paid, your kids have been behaving, and you feel blessed. And it's easy to worship God when you feel really blessed, isn't it? When you feel like he's just got his hands around you and he's just pulling you through. Oh, it's easy to worship. It's easy to worship when you're confronted with all of your sin and you realize that he died on the cross for your sins and that he saved you. It's easy to worship when you visualize him coming back one day and taking you to be where he is. But I know for me, sometimes I'm up in the, in the front row for three services. And I get tired. I know sometimes I'm sitting in the front and I'm not feeling it. Some of you, you, maybe you're in that same boat. And I got slapped upside the face because I'm not supposed to just worship him for how I feel and for what he's done. I'm supposed to worship him because of who he is. He's God and God deserves worship. I'm not at all of our locations, but I know somebody's watching you right now. And when it comes time to this invitation set, this weekend at all of our locations, I'm just gonna ask you, can we just, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what you're struggling with, can we just, can we just do a little wise men action and just worship him with everything we got because of who he is? Now what's missing? We've been building this nativity set and what's missing? There's, there's something missing. Oh, you're exactly right. A gigantic red dragon. That's right, you couldn't be more right. Because when you're reading the nativity, you're reading it in, in Matthew and you're reading it in Luke and you just forget about the gigantic red dragon. But if you turn to Revelation, chapter 12, verses one through five, listen to how John in Revelation records the birth of Jesus Christ. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his heads. They didn't have that version at Walmart, so we have to settle with one head, okay? His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. 
The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And the child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Don't miss this. Satan was there waiting, waiting to devour that child and waiting to devour you. He was there wanting to do everything in his power to keep this child of God from doing what he was sent to do, from rescuing us. Revelation goes on to say it calls him the accuser who stands before God day and night accusing you and accusing me of all of our sins. He shows up and he's trying to kill baby Jesus. That's why you see them fleeing fleeing off to Egypt because Herod has all the boys two years and under, killed in Bethlehem. Satan is there trying to kill Jesus because of what Jesus could mean for you and me. If Jesus gets to accomplish his mission, he's gonna bring about the forgiveness of sin, which is why Paul later writes, therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because this baby Jesus isn't gonna stay a baby. One of these days, he's going to stand up on his own two feet. He's going to walk on water. He's going to feed 5,000. He's going to carry that cross all the way up to the top of Calvary. He's going to die, and he's going to pay for your sins and mine. And when he's done, he's going to put that dragon flat on his back. There may have been a red dragon. And since if you read on in Revelation chapter 12, there's a war that happens, and he's doing everything in his power to take down heaven, but he can't because heaven's just too strong. So he comes here and he wages war against his offspring. He wages war against us, but Jesus came. And baby Jesus wasn't afraid of no red dragon. And he shows up on the scene and he brings something so special to each and every single one of us. If you're reading the Old Testament, it's as if a drum roll has started and it gets louder and louder and louder because the entire Old Testament is just leading up to this moment where Jesus is finally here because of what Jesus is going to do. Listen to how the verses describe him. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That means that Jesus is going to show up. He's going to be God because he is God here on earth so he can feel what you feel, experience what you experience. You tired? Good. Jesus got tired. You stressed? Jesus got stressed. You frustrated? Jesus got frustrated. You let down? Jesus was let down. You've been betrayed? Jesus was betrayed. He went through everything that you're going through. The only difference was he never sinned in the process. And he did that so that when he was hanging on that cross, He can pay for your sins and mine. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says, She will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. There's a couple things you got to grab out of this. One, every single one of us, every single one of you, regardless of where you're at in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a sinner and you need a savior. And that's why baby Jesus shows up. He shows up because you needed to be rescued. He showed up because you're in dire straits. He showed up because the last thing he wants is for you to go to hell. He wants you to have the hope of heaven in your heart. That's why baby Jesus showed up. And they give him the name Jesus, which means the Lord's salvation. You get his name and his mission all in the same name, in Jesus. Interesting thing is if you were to translate the name Jesus, which is in Greek, to the Hebrew name, it's Joshua. What did Joshua do in the Old Testament? He led the people to the promised land. And what's Jesus' mission? He's going to lead us to the promised land. He's going to lead us to heaven. And if you choose to follow Jesus, if you choose to accept what he did on the cross on your behalf, here's the good news. He will take you to the promised land. And that's why he showed up, because you needed it. And you might be going, okay, this entire scene, but why didn't Jesus just show up and make his presence known to everybody. Why this backdoor approach? Well, one of these days, Jesus is gonna come through the front door. 
One of these days, he's going to rip heaven wide open. He's going to come back on a white horse with legions of angels behind him. And when he shows up, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Because in that moment, you won't need to believe because you'll see it. He's going to just kick through the front door and say, I'm Jesus. And everybody's going to go, yes, you are. That's exactly what's going to happen. But notice what happens in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, so for God so loved you, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes. The reason Jesus doesn't show up through the front door and shows up through the back door is because you and I, our responsibility is to believe. If he came through the front door, there'd be no option to believe. Everybody would just go, yep. That's why Jesus didn't come down in huge flashing light and stand before the whole world and say, hey, I'm here. That's why he shows up in a barn with mom and dad who the world kind of think are of questionable character. That's why there's some shepherds that he lets in on the equation. That's why these wise men, none of this was spectacular the day that it happened. Because Jesus was inviting every single one of us to do the one thing the one thing that separates us from the rest of the world, the one thing that will rest upon how we answer this question will rest our entire eternity. Do you believe? And Jesus being the good God that he is gives every single one of us the option to believe. We're moving to a time, a decision.